to a well-designed business. My name is Luann Nigara, and I'm so glad you found this podcast. Together with my husband, Vince, and our partner, Bill, we have grown our company, Window Works, from the ground up. So I know and I understand the challenges you face in running your interior design business. I also know that your talent alone isn't enough to ensure your success. So on this podcast, we talk about strategies and practical steps to help you grow your business. But make no mistake about it. We have our share of fun here too, mixed in with those aha moments that I love so much. This isn't fluff. Nobody has time for that. Whether you are a new interior designer or a seasoned designer, I am here to help you create and to manage the kind of interior design firm that you dream of. It's straight talk and it's action. Are you ready? Let's get started. Hi, welcome to a well-designed business. Today, I'm just so excited to welcome a true icon in the interior design industry to the podcast, Vincent Wolf. Admired for his impeccable eye and unique perspective, Vincent Wolf has been at the top of the design industry for nearly 50 years. Wolf's work has been featured in all major lists and shelter publications, including Architectural Digest, House Beautiful, and Lux Interiors and Design Magazine. He was named to El Decor's magazine's inaugural list of design titans, as well as on their annual roster of a list of designers in 2021. Whenever a name like Vincent Wolf comes to my mind, a question always surfaces for me. What is it that sets designers like him apart? What is it that gives them their insight, the creativity, the passion, combined with that business savvy that enables them to grow and scale to this status? Is it something they're born with? Is it a specific approach? Is it a set of skills that anyone can develop? It's a conversation that I'm having more often lately, and I was thrilled to have Vincent on to give his insight. My conversation with Vincent is likely to inspire you to go out and learn to continue to improve yourself. And one way you can do that is by learning how Duke Renders can take your projects and your business to the next level. You know how frustrating it can be when your clients cannot understand or visualize your designs. Even though you use swatches, drawings, mood boards, and software like AutoCAD or SketchUp, it's often they really don't grasp what they're approving. Well, what Duke Renders does is offer 100% accurate done for you 3D renderings that present your designs in their entirety. This way you can make sure the client can fully understand and visualize your design before execution, saving you a ton of headaches back and forth, and especially a ton of costly and time consuming mistakes. Want to learn how to start saving time and avoiding delays? Book a quick intro call and create your designs in beautiful photo realistic renderings. Go to dukerenders.com forward slash Luann. That's dukerenders.com forward slash Luann. Okay, let's hear what Vincent has to say about becoming an icon, about how he approaches design, and how to break away from cookie cutter process so that you can create something truly special. Hey, Vincent, thanks so much for joining me on a well-designed business today. Well, thank you for having me. I'm looking forward to our conversation. I am too. And you don't know this because I didn't tell you, but you have been on my wish list for eight years. And I think over the years, I have randomly reached out. Um, And now it's happening. So I'm super excited uh, to have this conversation with you. You know, you're like, you know, a big deal. You're like one of those people in the industry. (laughs) That have survived. (laughs) Actually, that's a topic of our conversation, right? That's right. That's right. Because you know what? I have not reached the level of um, accomplishment that you have, but I have survived four decades in business. And that is the key, right? It is the combination of having some smart, you know, street smarts, having some chops, having some business acumen, but you have to like just plain survive, don't you? Yes, at whatever level you are. I mean, it's especially in a in an area like New York, where everybody's it's like everybody's trying to climb the ladder. So uh, Twyla Tharp, the choreographer, said to me a long time ago that if you just want to stay where you are, you have to still be trying harder because there's so many people behind. Yes, wanting to 
you know, take your place. So That's right. That's right. And so so what has it been for you, like going back um, the multiple decades that you've been in business and you've been designing? I've, I've interviewed nearly a thousand designers now, Vincent, and there are designers at a young age that have said to me, um, I want to be the Latina Martha Stewart. I want to be the la la la, the la la. So when you started, did, was that like a legitimate out loud in your brain goal to be an iconic designer with multiple books and projects across the globe? Or did it evolve and you just, you know, talent and expertise blended to create it? Um, I don't know if it's good or bad. I live day by day. So for <laughs> no, really, really. When okay. I started, it was, what am I going to do today? What job do we have? Uh, I, I, the idea of a long-term plan, yeah, I mean, I wanted to succeed. Uh, but I was very lucky because uh, my partner at the time, Bob Patino, we succeeded from the beginning. I mean, we were doing design that wasn't the norm. So there was the Saladinos and the Dorsos and the Ray Scheibels that we were all doing something that had not been done before in, in 30, 40, 50 years. Uh, so it was very easy. It wasn't, it has a, I find that to be a bigger struggle now than it was then. Um, mm. Because... It was just, you know, every day was, you know, when you start with nothing, mm. every day is better. Right, right. When you accomplish, then you have to like, you know, just try to stay at that level. So, And so do you think that in the beginning when it, you're saying it, you were lucky, right? Now, like, I, I, look, <laughs> It's got to be. It always is more than luck. Their luck can and often does play a part. But the thing is, do you look back and think there was a difference in the design? There was a difference oh, in your definitely. ability, right? I forget my ability. There was a difference in design. We were, I think, uh, again, I mean, I'm not going back to the thirties and forties, but in this sort of, you know, period of the 20th century, when we started, uh, designers weren't doing chins and tie back. That's all they were doing. They were decorating. When we started, we were designing, we were doing architecture. We were designing the furniture. We were creating environments that weren't about the past but looking forward to the future. Mm. And so it was a totally, you know, open ground. Uh, so I think that it was so exciting because the work, you know, I think that we're living right now in a period of time where it's all regurgitation. It's, mm. you know, the, the spaces are, there's, there's no ground being broken. So it makes it very hard because everybody's sort of, sort of thinking the same way of, unless you're very traditional uh, or just very severe on the other end. Mm -hmm. But if you're in the majority, you're everybody's sort of thinking the same sort of thing. At that time we were thinking like nobody else was thinking. And that was just so amazing. So, yes, there was the the inventiveness to unconsciously to look at design in a different way. Uh, but it wasn't something that was, you know, like a plan. It okay. just was we were thinking in a, you know, in a, I don't know. I was going to say through a tunnel, but it wasn't a tunnel. There was the direction. That was mm. the, the way of thinking. Partly because both Bob and myself had no design schooling. Okay. Had only the schooling of life, 
Uh, he worked in the showroom. I started working in the showroom, sweeping the floors. So it was a blank canvas. Mm. You know, if you went to Parson and you, you know, or you worked for Macmillan or you worked for Parrish Hadley, you know, you were already being set within a, a mold of a mm. way of thinking. We had, <clears throat> we didn't have any of that. We were just, you know, I don't know. I like chicken, so every day I eat chicken. You know, it was like thinking of what was natural and what was, you know, the way of thinking. Uh, I, the, the the way that I am putting it across right now was really the way it was then. It wasn't a, okay, now we're going to do this. No, we got a job, and you took that job, and you tried to, clean it up, make it modern, uh, eliminate the mundane and be inventive in the approach that you were using with all the different elements in, in creating that space. You know, it's interesting because as you're talking, Vincent, I'm, you know, melding together all the thousand conversations I've had with designers and I'm looking and I'm what I'm trying to do is I think there, you can call me out. You can say, no, you're mistaken because obviously you should if I am, but it almost feels like there is a blind spot in you that recognizes that your design is not normal. (laughs) Like you, you know, it's, 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 and, 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 and for, and I get it because it's truly your talent. Um, but having looked at a thousand different designers websites, there are many, many, many tens of thousands of hundreds of thousands of designers across the world that have a desire that have a passion, but you said something in there. We looked at it and we wanted to make it better, make it more creative, make it different, not just regurgitate what something else was done. And that I think is so deep in you that maybe you, maybe you don't see it as a superpower. I don't know. Yes. But you see, the problem is, is one created a pro I was going to, a program, a program that was very unique at the time. It got developed through decades uh, from very stark where every piece was in the same fabric and every line was or curved or straight and evolved into not, a, I hate the word eclectic, but it developed into environments that are individual in how the I see the client and how I think. But that has become the vocabulary now. Right, right. So it's when you say, you know, it's a bigger struggle now because I look at jobs. This may sound ridiculous, but I was on Instagram looking and I said, oh my God, I don't remember that job. And I realized it wasn't my job. It was somebody doing thinking through the same you know lens that thank you that i do and that is a problem because no longer you create an environment that stands unique you are thinking other people are thinking through the same lens I was at a book signing of a friend of ours that did a new book. And this person came up to me and he said, he said, my God, I remember you in the nineties. What you did was like so amazing. Nobody else was doing those things. I want to know what is it doing now that is unique? Who cares what it was then? I care now, you know, I want my work not to stand on the past, but stand on the present. And when I'm designing every time, yes, you know, I I bring certain ideas from other jobs, but I'm looking at each job as how can that job 
be a job that doesn't speak of, oh, that's a Vincent Wolf room. I mean, I guess it, it always will be a Vincent Wolf room because that's who's doing it. But, you know, it's, it's very hard. It's very hard mm -hmm. because grounds are not being broken, you know, or people are not all diversing into what their own point of view is. Mm -hmm. It's more about what's, you know, the norm, you know. So it sounds like that you are experiencing a frustration with the industry in general of the leaning on, say, Pinterest or Instagram for an inspiration for a room that a designer would then go and um, put together for their client as opposed to looking inward for what really is in them and their interpretation of where that room should go or should be. Is that what you're yes, expressing? But, but is it, y yes, but weren't the design magazines before there was Pinterix? Right. Okay. And designers weren't, yes, there was a, a small percent or a level of designer percentage that was doing whatever was coming out in the magazines just to be, but mm -hmm. I don't know that that's, I think now it's it, the sense of individuality has sort of disseminated. Mm. And I don't understand, is it, you know, when I started, I mean, I, and I still do, look at books, look at the past, look at, you know, what, David Hicks did and how he did it and one of the details that he did to then take it and develop my own point of view. Mm -hmm. Rather than uh, repeat it, you, you're right, building right, and interpreting. Well, what, what I always say to people here is, you know, you look through a book and something hits you, close that book and now put your vision of what that way of thinking down. Don't right. copy it. Because right. then it is no longer individual. Right. But I, you know, I have people that work for me and have worked through the years that don't know who Billy Baldwin was, who don't know who David Hicks was, who don't understand Lelou or, you know, they don't. It's like. That almost seems crazy, right? That doesn't that upsetting almost seem crazy. <laughs> because it's destroying our industry. Yeah. Because. I mean I'm sorry. I mean, is it, I'm sorry. No, no. I mean, it almost seems like being involved in computer, you know, inventions of computer programming or platforms or software or whatever, and not knowing who Steve Jobs is. It's sort of like, know your world, right? Like, know where you come from. Know what the influences are. Know what the the, the gold standards are, right? Well, how can you move forward if you don't know the past? Yeah. Because you can take the past and then develop the future. But when it's just what is being seen. I mean, I have clients that walk in, you know, and, oh, here's my lookbook. And, you know, that's, that's good for me because what it shows me is, you know, what colors are. But they're, they're making decision, design decisions without understanding the how, the where, you know, that creates those particular points of views. Yeah. And yeah. you just, you know, like you say, oh, how do you mix furniture together? Oh, that's so incredible. Well, because I've traveled, I've looked, I've educated myself in pulling out out of environments the things that appeal to me. And if I am selecting all those things through the, the eye, of course they're going to work together because right. it's all being, yes, it may be African or 18th century, but there's the same style soul that ties them all together. But you look at rooms in magazines or, and it's just like throw it together without understanding what you're throwing together. What I'm hearing is, you trust your own creativity. 
you trust it. That's what I'm hearing. Like if you, like you mentioned, there's something is one influence is some piece of furniture is another influence and a garden variety designer might be like, well, how do you mix them together? But you're seeing what it is that's common. That's not exact. That's not a duplicate, but the through lines through it, like you said, the eye through right. it, and then you trust it. You're just like, this is what, what goes together. I don't need outside approval on this. How can you break ground if you don't trust your gut? Yeah. yeah. Because, you know, it's your gut that's saying this is right. Yeah. And again, that comes from, I, I think, for me anyway, not having schooling, not having rules that were set for me, but just the things that to me that looks right. Uh, so that's an interesting uh, side thing there, Vincent. So, of course, I've interviewed dozens of accomplished designers. Thousands, that thousands. Yes, that don't have, well, but I mean that don't have the formal schooling, right? Uh-huh. So it's there's no shade on this show that somebody is or isn't formally trained because there's just too many examples like yourself mm-hmm. that are just so talented and it, it does throw the argument out the water. However, my question is, without the schooling and without the the technical, the, the like scale and proportion, I understand that can be something you could know in your heart and your soul. You don't need to be taught that. I know that for a fact, but the other technical aspects, when you were starting in the beginning, did you surround yourself with subs or with hiring people in your team that are actually going to do the stamp drawings and the things like that? Like, how did you cross no, that? Because but I, I was you weren't ang- like just doing living rooms here. I, w- <laughs> I was working for, I worked for people. Okay. So I, you started I learned, by working for others. Yeah. I mean, gotcha. people come to me in school and say, well, you know, we're gradu- I'm graduating and, you know, I want to open my business. I say, how can you open your business you. when you don't understand business? Thank you. <laughs> how, who's going to pay for your mistakes? The client? Right. No, I learned by just doing, by working for people, by you know, I would take jobs, again, because I didn't go to school, but I would find a plan. I would design the space. I would create all the elements that it took to get it to that stage. You know, you learn. I mean, you learn how far is a table from the sofa. You, you know, 50 years, you know, I have, I sit with I stand with people on job sites and they say, oh, well, this is the problem. I say, no, you solved this problem because I know that you better measure that sofa, the width, the length, and look at the hallway outside because if not, <laughs> you're not going to get into that space. And then you're going to, who's going to pay for it? The client. Everybody not makes that mistake once. It seems once. Like, right? <laughs> I mean, um, but there's all those things that, you know, you... Okay, I was in Egypt uh, in January. I'm looking at this painted wall of a a tomb, and it has reeds of of, uh, papyrus. And then in the bottom, there was a band. So all of a sudden, I looked at it, and I said, oh, I like to do recessed bases into the wall. So the wall and the baseboard is all at one level. I said, wouldn't it be great to do the look of the reeds at the bottom of a solid, you know, smooth wall and then the recessed base having like the scoops of, of, you know, so it gives, it gives it a sense of, you know, Greek or Mm -hmm. Egyptian to a modern space and nobody Mm -hmm. would look at it and say, oh, that's a Greek or uh, Egyptian influence. Those things you learn with time and with, experience and to venture forward out of school where all you've been given is rules and trying to fit you within a box and then start doing work for other people. Of course, it's not going to be inventive. And if, yes, maybe one in 10 will be, but right. in general, it won't be. It'll just be a cookie cutter situation because in school, they haven't been looking at books they haven't been learning history. They've been doing projects and looking to see wh- what ideas they can copy to include in their work. I love it. I, you know, and the thing is, so when we say you and you ended up working for other firms before you started your own firm. I got now- fired out of all of them. <laughs> 
your best entrepreneurs usually do. <laughs> yeah. Oh my goodness. That's so funny. I, I feel like there's a couple of stories in there, but maybe one day when we have a glass of wine at one mm-hmm. of the markets, you'll tell me those stories. Um, so question, when you are hiring in your firm and you introduce new team members, um, I'm not hearing that there's a bias to hiring somebody who has a formal education, but it's just, what's that next section? Are you coming out and you, are you traveling? Are you learning history? Are you working for others to expand beyond the rules is what I'm hearing. But, okay. One thing I learned, I'm dyslectic. I can't spell. I have no, sometimes no memory. Um, there, I have a lot of shortcomings. So when I'm hiring people, I'm looking to, for the people that fill in what I'm not good at. That's awesome. Um, are they talented? That's great. I right. mean, because you want juice, you know. But I'm more interested in are you filling in the gaps of the things that make a job successful? Mm. Maybe not in the creative, but in being organized, you know, knowing how to do CAD and all that, which to me, I think killed part of the creativity because when you put a paper to pencil or pencil to paper in a scale ruler, you understand that job much more than if you're just typing it like a secretary into a computer. But Interesting. it is what it is. Um, so <laughs> I, 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 I'm looking for people that are very organized, that are very clear in how they come across. Because if you're on the job site and you're like discombobulated, that contractor, that workman is not going to fully get your message. Mm. So th- those are the things that I'm looking and talent. But, you know, it's, I'm very selfish (laughs) because I'm doing this because I love design. So to have a firm with 200 people uh, and have them doing all the designs and you're going out and getting the clients... I'm not good at going out and getting the clients. So, you know, and I've had people that I've interviewed, oh, well, you know, I love finding one-of-a-kind pieces and designing rooms and picking colors. And I say, and what am I going to do? <laughs> Thanks so much. Just sign your check? <laughs> you know, it's, if you do that, I have the, I could get fired, <laughs> you know. Um so, you know, it's, but when they come in here and what I've learned is I have people that work for me that have a lot of experience, but three quarters of people that are just starting because I find it easier to train somebody to think the way we think than to get somebody that thinks one way and convince them to think another way. Yeah. The people that have the experience have experience in how do you manage a job? How do you, that organization of this goes and then this goes and then this goes, which I am not good at. (laughs) I'm good at overseeing it, but I'm not good at, Believe me, we're two of the same, you know, like literally, I mean, it it is the thing, right? Somebody is the creative, somebody is the lead, somebody is the visionary, somebody is the one that understands the goals and the mission and the direction. And then we need the best people around us to help us execute it. It's our job to make sure they understand our mission and our vision and our values, right? Um, But you're right. Like, we don't want to get fired from our own companies. (laughs) But the people that are new that are starting when they leave here and they they leave they're leaving understanding really about trusting your gut mm. about how do you run a job 
business wise, you know, how do you look at things and not just take it off the top, but really understand what is that decision that you're making and is that the best way to resolve the problem? And I think that, you know, it, it's, it's good that they leave that way. Um, and so that's a good um, point. You know, with someone like yourself who, like you said, this is this is what you want to do. You don't want to not design. There are iconic design firms, larger design firms, iconic or not, that the goal of the principal is to get to the point, to be rainmaker, to oversee the project at certain touch points, and to have, you know, um, train up and inspire up people within their team to lead the design. And, but that's not yours. And you like being in the weeds doing the design. So with that comes almost this inherent idea that there is going to be an expiration date on almost any creative that comes to you that has this goal to be the one with the vision for the design, whether it's a three-year, five-year, eight-year role. But they they must come in understanding. I'm going to come in. I'm going to soak it all up. I'm going to try and learn. I'm going to try and just be next to a master for as many years. But it's a, it's a training and a stopping ground. It's not I'm going to be here for 25 years, right? Well, no, because I've had people work for me for 25 years. Yeah. But when they come in and I look at that resume, and I, I was one year in this place and one year in this place, one year in this place. It's like, forget uh-uh. it. Uh-uh. It takes a year to at least to train somebody. Yes. I, no, you're not going to write my coattails and put me on your resume to get the next one year job. Gotcha. Um, yeah. I think that because we're a small firm, uh, you know, I'm doing a sandwich shop around the corner from here. I'm not charging him. I've been going in there for since 1988. And (laughs) for four years, I've been telling him, you know, you need to do something with this. I mean, so I said, I'll design it for you. So it's, the sense of the design compared to doing a townhouse uptown. Um, they're seeing that. They're seeing that. They're seeing that we're doing sets, that we do restaurants, that we you know, just create. Yes. And the freedom of not get the job that's the right budget and that's your goal. The right. goal is to create and to do it without con- understand no acceptance of the budget but because this hour he gave me ten thousand dollars to to do the the space how do we design that make it like people who pass by in the street wow let me go in there for ten so ten thousand is the budget for the design part of it <laughs> the, the, no or, materials, the whole that's what thing. I'm like, oh, that's what I meant. It's like the the fixtures. In other words, you're probably getting paid in salami sandwiches, right? It's like <laughs> turkey sandwiches, <laughs> turkey sandwiches. <laughs> no, it's like I see the man work, yeah, and he works like a dog. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. And so, I have something that's gonna maybe help him do better. Yes, it's a gift. So yes. you want to share your gift. Yeah, uh, because people have shared it with me. Right. So you know, it's no, the- I love it. I love the whole idea of it. It's like you know, it's that's the whole thing when you run your own business. You make the rules. You can make a decision right. when you would love to contribute your gift to someone. You know, and of course, you've been going there since what did you say, eighty eight or ninety eight? Eighty eight. <laughs> eighty eight. Right. Like, and it's, it's looked the same. Yeah, it's like, buddy. <laughs> do it for free. Just let's do it. Well, it's, I know yeah. that that business will do better yeah. if we're presenting it Friday. I know it'll do better if it looks a certain way. You got to worry. You might not be able to get a seat anymore once you make it better and more busier. Or he may say, <laughs> what the hell are you giving me? I like it the way it is. But it's interesting. I was yeah. in Chad. Chad is a country and Africa. Okay. And I was staying at this this 
it wasn't disgusting. It was a pleasant, low-level hotel. Okay. And in the rooms, they had an idea. And when I looked at it, I said, that is, that's perfect for the, for the sandwich shop. So I'm presenting something that is what would make that space, I think, shine different than the rest mm. of the stores around it. And that came from left field. Yes. You know, it didn't come from going through books on sandwich shops or <laughs> looking at interior design magazine. It came from a, just from someplace else, you know. Yes. Uh, yeah. So, so one question I would love to understand, regardless of if somebody's budget is 10 K or probably multiple millions, there's been times when your budgets have been multiple millions. What is the intersection of the design versus the budget? Like, how do you stay within the budget? Yes, when you have this infinite like ideas and you're like this could be amazing or budget um like design what's the phrase? Oh my god, I just went out of my head talk about bad memory. Um Concept. That, um you know uh gosh, when you when you have to design to the budget like oh, it'll come to me. Um, restrictions. <laughs> or... Restrictions. That's probably a good way to say it. Like in other words, regardless if you're designing on okay. Park Avenue with a $2 million furnishing budget for three rooms, there's going to be a point where you're going to have to not put something in the design because the budget is at max. How do you do Can that? I give you? Yeah. Okay. You have to cook dinner. <laughs> it has to taste decently well in what's in the refrigerator. Okay. <laughs> yes, you could go out and great, get a get a, get a pheasant, but no, in the refrigerator you have eggs, you have some onion, you have cream. Yeah. Is it going to make be... it work, sweetie? <laughs> so when I'm just I'm given a budget, I know don't go there. I'm thinking really within the, those perimeters. Yeah. I don't. When it's we possible, just, is what you're saying. You stretch yourself, you stretch well, your creativity, the, and you make it work. You don't even stretch it. You're just going. I within, don't mean stretch the budget. You stretch your own mind to make it work. No, you're just going by the perimeters, mm -hmm. by your boundaries. Mm -hmm. I mean, when we design a job, we design it. Client comes in, we they sign the contract, we go through questionnaires. And the space is measured, photographed. It gets drafted, given to me, and then I design the space. After that, it's drawn, it's estimated, it's all put together. I don't give choices. You know, it's, this is the design. Uh, and then presented to the client. It's like two and a half months or, you know, around of designing, of estimating, of you know, finding the right thing. I don't want to shoot a blank. I want to get it oh, right. Yeah. Right. So I'm not going, oh, well, let's do that. Let's a post to the walls and Fortuny at $300 a yard. <laughs> you can't. Let's paint the walls. Let's do something over the bed that works. I'm designing within what yes. the givens, not... Mm -hmm. I'm not doing it for myself. I live in a loft. I mean, I don't have to stay at a four-star hotel. I can sleep on the floor in, in Africa, and I'm not bothered. Right. I am given a budget. I am designing it for them, not for me, because I don't live like 99.99 .99 of my clients do. Mm. I don't want to live that way. Right, right, right. You know, so when you said, you said in there, I pick it, it's what it is. You're like, there, there's not, I'm not giving options. It's, I'm not saying, well, you have this fabric and this fabric or this plan and that plan. No, because I trust my instinct. And when my instinct says, this is the right plan, I'm not going to show her three plans because two of those three is not what I think is the right thing. Right. But when I present it and we give them a presentation book and I mean, we go through every pillow, every fabric, everything is priced. Oh, I don't, 
I just had a presentation not so long ago. Oh, my God, you gave me mohair. I forgot to tell you that my daughter is allergic to different textures and, mm. and that that's that, that's not going to work. Okay. So okay. I found a fabric, you know, right. or I don't like that chair. I'll tell you why that chair works because the roundness of that with the square of the sofa is a nice yin and yang. I, I still hate it. Okay. Let me show you something else. But it's the individual things. I think if you, as a designer, business, because time is money, every hour you spend on a job keeps reducing your profit. Mm -hmm. So what I try to do is by designing everything at once, they are not going, if I were going and show, okay, let's go look at sofas. Okay, let's go look at club chairs. Let's go look at fabric. That's time. And that's time that may not create a cohesive design because she may like that chair and that fabric and that it may not all work together because they're looking at things individually. When they look at a total environment, then they're seeing a point of view, mm. not individual pieces. Right. So each time that you show them going into the D&D building and looking at this and like, it's the confused. And then who's right. designing that job? Right. Are they designing it or are you designing it? Right. You have to have a conviction that what you're presenting is the right thing and know how to sell it and know how to put the excitement that you have into it and then make whatever adjustments. But you don't have to adjust everything because today she liked the chairs. Maybe tomorrow, oh, I saw in the magazine this chair. <laughs> You know, like it, it. there's no co cohesive design thread. It's just a selection. I am not hired to buy furniture. Right. I am hired to create an environment. And that environment is what I see. Yes, ma'am. So I, I, here's the thing. I'm with you. I love this. It's, you know, it's being the leader on the project, which is exactly what you've been hired to do. But... But. Well, no, no, and eh. so, and and I also know that maybe you know, maybe you were born with it. Maybe you started what from your first time you started your company after you had your training with the other firms, where you understood that sentence that I am designing an environment. I'm not picking a sofa or selling you a chair, but. I, you have to have had conversations with designers over the years who don't grasp this concept, don't mm -hmm. understand it, and fall prey and fall victim to that, oh, now they want the sofa reselected and then they were reselected and, and they don't stand up and say no. So I'm just asking – were you were you born with it? Were you did you always come to a project, even the first ones when you were brand new starting out, or my did first, you develop the concept? Okay, my, so you were. You just because yeah. let me just say one thing. I yeah. worked for designers, but I always selected designers that had no taste. Uh, I didn't want to work for for Angelo or for Mel Dwork. I have worked for people that when I left there, I knew what not to do because I knew exactly what I wanted to do. Okay. Uh, so, but those people that are doing the other, my shrink says, <laughs> designers <laughs> are insecure people that always want people's approval. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Oh, do you like it? Do you like it? Do you like it? I mean, I want, I want you happy. Right. You know, I've had clients say, well, you're not making me happy. I said, that's not my job. <laughs> that comes from within. Happiness, you know, comes from inside. Um, yes, they give them what they – are they happy? Because if we are in the business of just making money, we should be in Wall Street. Right. Not here because there you're going to make much more. Right. We're getting paid financially, but the bigger payment is your soul. Mm. And your soul is the thing, that child inside of you, 
that when you've done what you think was the best that you could do, that child is is fed. Mm. And if that child is not being fed, then all you're getting is the money. Mm. And the money is not enough for the bullshit that we all have to deal with. <laughs> so then, but some people can't do it because maybe they don't have the vision to create a total environment. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It has to do with, and that's not a judgment. No. Maybe it is. But <laughs> what are you coming to the, no, what are you coming to the table with? Do you have, are you just good at making scrambled eggs or are you a five-star chef? Yes, yes. And, and that, and you know something? Those people that do that find the client that want that. Yeah, yeah. Water seeks its own level. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, I think at the level that we work, there's less of a audience mm -hmm. because if you have a very clear point of view, then that client. No, oh no, I want to participate, or oh no, that's too much of a mixture, or you know, so you you limit your your range of clientele by having a very clear point of view. Mm. But I, and it's always a conflict in me. But a, I don't know how to do the other because you know it's so funny because I'm working with a very instinctual once you start to question it once you start to change it it you know it throws me off balance because i'm i said to clients you're coming to an artist to do your portrait i am the artist you're i'm interpreting through my point of view who you are uh so it changes there are different interpretations but once you start like fumbling through a n no vision land, I find it very hard because I'm, I get like, I start to question, I mean, yeah, is that right? Is it not? Because it's no longer falling within my understanding. Right. I mean, I would love to do traditional rooms, but through my point of view. Right. Yes, I'll do tiebacks, but, you know, they're, they're going to be linen instead of chintz. Right. And, right. and the chairs are going to be 18th century, but they may be in leather instead of a damask. But the room is going to, I think, in the long run, be more authentic than a recreation of what the past was. Right. Because we're no longer in the past, we're in the present. So, right. very confusing. You well, know? you know, it's funny. I have to say, I'm really, this is like just me being level with you. <laughs> I am so glad that I didn't have the opportunity to interview you several years ago. I started the podcast eight years ago, Vincent, because I wouldn't have had the perspective, the chops, the depth of understanding to really understand what you're saying. I know I wouldn't have, but it's through all these conversations over these years. I, and you don't know this about me. I come from 40 years of being a custom window treatment uh, designer. And so that was my first life. And I worked with many of the top designers in New York City over those years. And that's how, you know, the one path led to the other path. But like, I know you, part of you, I'm seeing your face. Part of you is like, is this making sense? Am I making myself understood? But you are. And really. Oh, the, I think I am okay, very good. clear. Okay. Okay, it, good. Because sometimes you're ending the sentence like, you, do you get me? <laughs> no, I mean, did it, did it come across in a legible or yeah no that's what i'm saying like i know you know what you're talking about but i i have gotten the sense that you're like is this coming across are you getting it and i'm just telling you point blank if i had interviewed you six years ago i would be like 
that man is a lunatic. I have no idea what he's talking about. I would, but it wouldn't have been you, your shortcoming. It would have been my shortcoming. And so I really hear this really deep personal connection to the creative process and this deep commitment to you are the artist. You are putting together an environment, not a sofa. And when you were describing it, it's no different than if we went to Carnegie Hall and we were watching a, a conductor do a symphony and from the audience, we're like, hey, wait, change that part there. Hey, wait. And the and the, symph- the conductor would be like, you change one part, the whole thing dominoes. And I don't know that interior designers instinctively really value that in themselves, that they are creating and a complete experience, a complete environment. And when you do your creativity from that, that level that you do, seeing a, a, a base, you know, the base of a tomb, you know, seeing a, a detail in a hotel room in Africa, when you're doing it at that level and you are actively pursuing and making yourself better at that level, I think that's where it comes. Like, no, you don't get to change that thing. That would be ridiculous because well, nothing you, is the same. You can change it. But I am going to because it's their it's their home. Yeah, it's well, I get money. that, but I mean, you're not. They're not like it's not like here's twenty things, change ten, and we're going to keep moving. I get right. that you're a businessman and you're not going to like not be accommodating to a point. But what I'm hearing is the bigger it's the it's the reason it belongs there for a reason. It wasn't just clipped. Yes, yes, yes. That's the thing, and you well, you have the reason for it because. If you're a good friend of mine, Tim Corrigan, amazing mm. designer. I mean, charm and just, I wish I was him. Um, <laughs> but his rooms are like so many elements and so many layered layered and, yeah. and it, patterns and textures and shapes. and. But what I do is 10 items. Yes. And you they know, all matter then, right? Right, because it's that's what makes it what it is. Because it's a sentence. Yes. You can't take out of a sentence five words and still have the point come across. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so it's, but I don't think clients understand that because they're. I think designer. It's interesting. There are a lot of bad architects out there. Mm-hmm. But architects are respected and, you know, like yes. revered. Designers are not. Because designers, I think, have never put across the value of the environment. Y- yes, it's Frank Lloyd Wright did it. Ah, the master or the master's wife created that environment but most designers are seen as putting frosting on a cake Mm -hmm. and not dealing with the importance of you know i think there's a difference between a designer and a decorator i mean to me a designer is dealing with the environment is changing walls changing details uh a designer is applying more to the space. Um, I don't know. You mean a decorator is applying more to the right, space? Right, 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 yeah. right. Yeah, yeah, sorry, yeah, yeah, sorry. Yeah. Right, right, right. Uh, like accoutrement, right, right. Like adding to it, making it better, right. a talent unto itself. Not everybody can do it, but it, it, the distinction in your mind is is that, yeah. And I don't see that most people understand the difference. Mm. If it's being done by an architect, they understand it. I mean, I've done, I've worked for people that I've done complete renovations. I mean, of gutting the space and recreating the environment. And then they'll say, well, should we have an architect look at it? And it's like, <laughs> because they still don't. Yes. Yeah. I guess you don't have the degree or. I don't know. It's, it's well, a, and that's also a lack of standards in the industry, right? I right. mean, that's, you know, the architect industry is standardized. Like you get, don't get to put that after your name if you don't have ac- certain credentials. And it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a quagmire, right? Yes, it's but, a quagmire. But, but there are architects that are stink 
that yes. have that after their name. Right. Well, that's like my husband said. Designers, to, you know. Right. But somebody, Vinny always says somebody has to finish bottom of their class. Like, <laughs> just because, like when we go to a doctor and, you know, we're not happy with a doctor. I'm like, move on. Like, you know, somebody was at the bottom of the class. Just because this person is a doctor doesn't mean they're a good one. Doesn't mean they can actually take care of us well, you know, so. So let me, ask, let me ask you a question. When you talk to all these hundreds of designers, do you see a difference in, is it a business? Is it creative? Uh, How do you, how do you rate in total the people that you have interviewed? So here's the thing. Um, I certainly have interviewed many people that have it all, that have the creativity, that have the business sense, that have the plan both for a creative execution of a project, but also for the business execution of a project. I have met those unicorns. They are out there. And it's exciting to have those conversations. Then others have parts of it. And they don't like I can I can typically tell if somebody really does have their business chops, if they are running a profitable business or not. But the truth of it is my mission is to help all designers who are interested to be better at what they do, to be better at the business side so they can continue to put their gifts into the world. And so what I know for a fact is that each conversation, each person I speak with doesn't have to be good at all of it. Like you said, you hire people around you to do the things that your gaps are. So I know like if somebody's superpower is, I remember years ago, I I had a conversation with Chad James. I don't know if you know Mm -hmm. him. Right. And and this, and 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 the thing is what he, the the point of view on the conversation was his hiring process like legitimately the interview process that he puts everybody through from intern all the way up and it was so detailed and so specific and if you needed a hiring process you could sit with a pen and paper listen to that episode and make parts of it or all of it your own and so in that hour he's teaching us a really valuable component. So I don't need any one person. I don't need you to be to talk to me about what you're not good about. At if you're a good business person, you've got somebody doing that on your team. But what I want to talk to each person about is what they are good about. So with you, we thought we were going to talk about survival. What we're talking about is creativity. But it it's is where, survival. It is. I that's get it, how, and I'm going to that's... go there again. <laughs> but but you understand, like I I. I know when somebody is running a good business or not, but as long as they're doing something good, that's of service to my community and And to me. I will tell you, you could be the most talented. And through the years, I've met or seen really extraordinary talented people. If you're not a good business person, if you're not running that business, you know, like you're not going to succeed. No. Because... Talent is not really what makes somebody succeed. I think running the right business can make you succeed because you're doing, you're billing, you're doing, you're selling, you're, you know, presenting, you're running jobs the right way. And if you don't, if you don't do that, you know, if you don't have the right contract, if you don't, you know, stand for Oh, you want to change my commission? Okay, whatever. What do you want to pay me? (laughs) No, I have rules. You may not want to work with me, but these are the rules of how I work in business. And these are the rules how I run my business. And to have you come in and tell me how to run my business, that, you know, that doesn't work very well. Yes, you can adjust, but you're not going to, and if so, if you don't do those things, you're not going to succeed. You know? No, no. It's the premise of the whole show is uh, what I what's what's true. What is one thousand percent true is magic happens when somebody has that cross section of true talent and business, business, and they they either have business acumen or they surround themselves with p- trusted people who do. But here's what's also true. 
That's the magic. That's, that's, that's the unicorns like yourself and others out there. But then what I also know is if your talent is the thing, you have super extraordinary talent and you do not run the business, a person with mediocre talent with exceptional business skills can be more successful right. will make more money may not they might not get an ad 100 they may not get the accolades but they're the ones going to be bringing or they'll two, get three, to four design thousand dollars a year for their person for their family and they will consistently be designing that is 1000 right. percent true yeah because if you don't if you don't you know it's like to cook meals and nobody eats it right to be right. creative and not be able to create I mean, that is, I'll be very honest. Well, that's my big, if she said, what is your biggest fear is not to be able to design. Mm -hmm. Money, I I mean, I can't say trillions, but I have, I could stop. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But not to create is, is not to hear music, not to see art. Right, Right. I mean, I travel already, I garden already. But I, if I don't design, a part of me will die, you yeah. know. Yeah. So, and if you don't run your business the right way, you won't you get that pleasure, you, you know. You won't get to do it. Exactly. So before I let you go, this has been okay. such a pleasure. I appreciate you so much. Um, we did say we were going to talk about survival. And I know all of this goes into survival, cultivating your creativity, making sure that, you know, you're running a good business, all these things. But when you think about it as a, you know, I hate to say as a final thought because it becomes this big onerous thing, just a, a closing thought, maybe advice to designers who are listening, who, sh- you know, aspire to actually have that unicorn of talent and business at, or, and to survive decades of it. Anything come to mind, Vincent? Trust your gut. Love it. Fight for what you believe. Love it. Run your business the way you may not feel people may accept you. Oh, you're sending me a contract. Well, I don't want to sign a contract. Well, this is my contract. You have to have the conviction of self to run your business the right way and not buckle to pressure from bullies that in their, in our business clients, there are a lot of bullies, especially Mm -hmm. the ones with a lot of money. Yeah. I would Uh, think the the more wealthy they are, the more they think they're going to determine how the game is going to be played when they engage with you. Right. Yes. Yeah. Uh, So bully, trust your gut. Uh, no, not bully. <laughs> yes, be a bully. <laughs> stand know, up to the bully. <laughs> run, stand up for what you believe. Fight. It doesn't mean that you have to beat the hell out of them, but and use logic. Mm-hmm. I find that when they're sitting here, the husband and the wife, they don't really understand the aesthetic beauty of it, but they understand the logic. Mm-hmm. Why a square goes with a round the sense of yin and yang instead of having it all the same. Same. Using logic, practice being a salesman because if you can't sell it, it it doesn't go down. What else? You know, don't think that you can live like your clients because they have the money and you probably don't have as much. (laughs) Um, To travel, to experience... Um, and just, you have to stand by what you believe Mm. to be dying and not to have stood for what you believe that, you know, that's a hard pill to swallow, you Mm. know? Yeah. I agree. Oh my goodness. Uh, you know what? This has been outstanding. It's such a pleasure and a gift. Amazing. Amazing. I appreciate it. Oh, thank you so much, Vincent, really. Thank you. Thank you for having me and to help me share with people that really, if it helps them, people help me. So if I can help others that, that, and if they like, they should buy my book that just came out in the, in the, uh, at the end of last year. Um, so yeah, we will put the links to all of your books. 
in the show notes for the episode, 1,000%. And I'll be sure to mention them when I talk about this in my outro. One has to make a buck, you know. This is true. It's all about the business. We got to do that first. (laughs) Thank you. Thank you. So you've heard me explain it often enough. I always go into podcast interviews with a plan of what I expect we're going to talk about. And then the guest and I have a little pre-show chat where we scope it out and we get agreement on the direction of the conversation. And while this often inspires things that we didn't specifically plan to talk about, we usually do follow a through line. But this conversation, it went completely different. It went in a complete different direction than Vincent and I talked about. And boy, am I glad it did. I had a similar conversation about creativity on our recent overheard episode with Layden Lewis, Charles Pavarini III, and Maria Viola Kutroff. Like Vincent, these designers take creativity seriously. It's not just about doing what clients want. It's not about replicating what they, the client, or you sees in design magazines or on Pinterest. It's not even just about creating something visually stunning. It's so much more to each of these designers. It is their art. It is experiences inspired by travel. It is knowing that every single thing in a space is chosen with intention. They design to tell a story, to strike an emotion, to bring a detail from the curve of a mantle to the shape of a handle in the bathroom. And I do think it's telling that all of these designers also teach in some form. For Leighton, Charles, and Maria, that's in formal education setting as instructors at the various universities. For Vincent, it's teaching his junior designers and educating them and the rest of us through his books, including his most recent book, Creative Interior Solutions, which of course we will link in the show notes. You are going to want to get your hands on this book. Now, they all have a passion for this and they want to help younger designers, newer designers break out of the funk of what Vincent calls regurgitation. And what I want to point out is something that Vincent pointed out, and I don't want you to glaze over. It's worth repeating. Pinterest didn't do this to us. It didn't do this by itself. The tool is not to blame. Like he said, before Pinterest, there were design magazines and other avenues to look at design. Pinterest, yes, has made it easier to be lazy, okay, because it's right there on your phone, but it didn't create it. You always had the choice. He always had the choice, the choice to create or to regurgitate. And the thing is, he chose to create. And this is one of those differentiators. This is one of those things that I believe shows up whenever I have the opportunity to talk to somebody who's truly iconic with a multi-decade career like his. So you have to look in the mirror. You're the only one who knows. Are you creating or regurgitating? And I found it very telling and compelling when Vincent talked about clients wanting multiple options. You heard him. To him, it is a complete contradiction to do what he's doing as a designer and artist. It's a contradiction to hire him as a designer and an artist and a visionary and then ask him to change the design, (laughs) right? Did you hear the stick point there? He has the confidence in his skill and his craft as a designer to know that he's not a conduit. He's not just simply a path to commodities, to sofas, to rugs. He's actually creating a thoughtful, cohesive design in which every item, every decision was made on purpose. He is not doing design by the numbers. This is not a paint by numbers kit from Walmart, okay? This was the exact point of view from Layden, Charles, and Maria two weeks ago. When you switch your mindset and you own and acknowledge that your creativity is unique, that it is of value, you will not spend time sourcing, resourcing, shopping, switching, and designing by the numbers. This is knowing on a deep fundamental level your own worth as a designer. Now, I don't think that there's very many of you in my audience who are trying to cut corners and be copycat designers, 
right? Because you are every single time you choose to listen to the show, choosing to up level your business. But do they exist? Yeah, they do. Okay. But do you do better? You know what you can do. All right. Now, I also don't think that Vincent is saying that you can never change a direction or make a switch that your client is asking for, for a really good reason. Okay. And I don't think he's saying that clients are inherently wrong when they ask or that they're out of line when they ask. But he is pointing out two issues with this. The first is time. He mentioned it. Revisions take time. He talked to you about it. He said they eat into your profitability. So business head Luann is right there with them. And this is probably what I would have imagined was the issue associated with revisions before speaking with Vincent. He showed us that it's more than that. It's about ownership. It's about leadership. It's about the vision of the design. And this, my friends, comes from you, not the client. Okay. If you can do what Vincent does, if you can channel that deeper creativity and weave together this tapestry of design to the point where every piece matters and every thing has a place in the story of that space, then by default, you will know your worth, right? Think about it. If you know it, you know it, right? If you know why everything is there, then you know it's the result of your unique creativity. And when you arrive at this stage in your career, in your growth as a creative, you are not going to second guess your decisions. You're not going to walk back on your fees. You're not going to back and forth over every little item in the design. You will walk with confidence and command like Vincent. And this quiet confidence, this elegant self-assurance, this tells clients who you are and what you're about. This mindset will change the way you communicate, the way you set and explain expectations, the way you present estimates and contracts, okay? The way you market yourself, it changes all the things, right? And I want to highlight an important nuance here. This is not... Vincent saying, suggesting, or me either, that we are like, hey, I'm the expert. I know everything. It's my way or the highway. It's not digging your heels in for the sake of digging in your heels. This is where Vincent's actual true wisdom and advice comes into play. He said, you know, if you know because you designed it with intention, then you know it. And then the second part is getting good at being a salesperson. Okay, you must sell your design and your art and your value with that same confidence. This comes from understanding at your core what you bring to the table. When you tap into this and you effectively communicate and sell this to clients, they will trust you and they will let you lead. Okay. And along with all that excellent creative advice, not let's not overlook the business savvy that Vincent talked about, especially in working for others. I am obviously all about running your own business. This is what this we're dedicated to, helping you do that more profitably. Sometimes and most times for if you're listening to the show, this is probably your path, okay? But working for someone else is always a good idea, okay? This is where Vincent started and he credits a lot of his success and his business acumen and a lot of the ins and outs that he's learned by working for others. He's not the only one. I remember the interviews with Andrew Sovolsky and Sarah Magnus, also the dynamic duo of Jesse Carrier and Mara Miller, the principals of Carrier & Co. These are all high-end luxury design firms that each talked about how they worked at good firms first and cut their teeth and learned from masters, okay? So I encourage you to go back to listen to those episodes for, you know, tons of advice on how to up level your, your everything, (laughs) right? In order to achieve, achieve that status of being a luxury designer, truly. This has been such a great episode. And before I go, I want to thank our show sponsor, My Doma Studio. My Doma Studio is your complete designer toolkit. My Doma makes it easier for you to streamline your processes, track your projects, communicate with your, your clients and get 
organize. It is created by designers for designers, specifically to address what you need as an interior design professional. I've said countless times that systems and processes are how you reach the next level of profitability. My Doma Studio makes it easier for you to do that. You can get 20% off your first three months by going to mydomastudio.com forward slash a well-designed business. It will also be in the show notes. So thank you. Thank you, Vincent. I am in awe of what you do. And I am grateful that I was able to have this conversation with you. And thank you for listening. Thank you for showing up. I appreciate it. Decide to be excellent. Thank you for joining me today. This podcast is a production of Luann Nigara Inc. If you want to know more about me, my books, or Luann University, go to luannnigara.com. And if you are interested in having Window Works help you with your next window treatment or awning project in the New York, New Jersey metro area, go to windowworksnj.com to learn more. Have an excellent day.